Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's for me a particularly great pleasure to continue what we did uh, already in the past, to have a dialogue with Satya Nadella, who uh, I don't have to introduce him, who probably is a highly, the most regarded and respected leader in industry and uh, the chairman and CEO of Microsoft. So, um, uh, just when you, should you have a question or a comment, please stand up and mention your name. But let me let me start with a discussion with uh, uh, you, Satya. And it seems when we look at the fourth industrial revolution that now in technological development, when you look at the S curve, we are really at the point where we have the exponential development. We see it, uh, just look at the announcements over the last weeks, uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and I could go on and on. Now, um, Satya, you, you are at the forefront of uh, those technological developments in many ways. And um, what do you see, what major shifts will come out of, this, uh, of those developments? Uh, and I mean, what would be the final result of all those <laughs> dynamics? Now, first of all, Klaus, it's fantastic uh, to be back here and have this conversation. And I, I think you described it well, which is, um, where are we on the S-curve? Um, and interestingly enough, uh, I sort of think about it as there's one S-curve where we are at the tip, where it's now about deployment, diffusion, mainstream. In fact, one of the things I think a lot about is in a time like this where, let's just say, with all of the macroeconomic challenges, mm -hmm. uh, or take even inflation, I think it's showtime for us even in the tech industry to really say, OK, how can software, for example, be a deflationary force so that every business can do more with less? So there's one side of it, which is, real deployment of technology so that we can use the most malleable resource we have in order to tame some of the inflationary forces. A good example, to just give you one, is, uh, you know, there's a, um, uh, you know, take what Unilever has done with their lights out manufacturing with digital twits. Mm -hmm. It was great during the pandemic as a way to do manufacturing uh, remotely, but more importantly, in silico, they're able to simulate and reduce energy cost, water wastage, and other wastage. So therefore, that's a good example of doing more with less. So that's one side. The other side is something like artificial intelligence. Uh, if you look at it, it's at the beginning of a new S-curve. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the fun, fun part of being in the tech industry, where there are certain technologies that are reaching maturity that need to get deployed and show real results. And then we now have, essentially, an emergence yeah. of a completely new set of technology, which I think is going to be a revolutionary. You say uh, it will be a revolution. Um, I think we all feel it will be a revolution, but there is a certain fear, particularly about artificial intelligence. Uh, people feel it dehumanizes us and so on. Now, what, what steps do we need, actually, to make sure that those uh, technologies, particularly artificial intelligence, remain society-oriented and human-centered? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great point, and I think a very important consideration, and quite frankly, a design consideration. In fact, one of the uh, things we think a lot about is how to deploy this technology to empower human beings to do more. So, yeah. for example, like on New Year's Day, I saw this tweet uh, by Andrej Karpathy, who was uh, an ex-founder of the autopilot group at Tesla, uh, who's an, you know, a, 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 an AI developer. And so he sort of referenced perhaps the biggest product that made a difference in his life in the last 12 months was the GitHub Copilot we had launched last year. So, so here's a software developer using tools uh, and saying, now GitHub Copilot is generating 80% of his code. So it's, that doesn't mean Andridge is not writing uh, new code and being at his creative best. It just so happens that now he has 80% leverage in doing what he's doing. He's still the pilot. 
he does have a co-pilot. Uh, so that's why I even like the branding of what we did there, because I think it helps put the pilot in charge and the co-pilot helping the pilot. But that's one example. Of it. I'll give you another anecdote, which for me perhaps was the most revealing of what can happen. I was in India uh, at the beginning of uh, January, yeah. and I saw this uh, demo, Klaus. In India, one of the things that's very exceptional that's happening is digital public goods that are getting built for identity, payment, many systems. And one of the digital public goods that's getting built is for language translation. Right? So basically, they have an open source project so that anybody building any application in India can translate between any language in Indian, any Indian language. So a demo I saw was a rural Indian farmer trying to access some government program, right? So he just expressed a complex thought uh, in speech in one of the local languages. That got translated and interpreted by a bot. And a response came back saying, go to a portal, and here is how you'll access the program. He said, look, I'm not going to go to the portal. I want you to do this for me. And it completed it. And the reason why it was able to complete it was because it, they had the, a developer building it had taken GPT yeah. and trained it over all of the Government of India documents and then scaffolded it with the speech recognition software. So think about what that meant, right? That basically meant that a large model, a foundational model that was developed in the West Coast of the United States a few months before, had made its way to, to a developer in India who then sort of added value to it to make a difference in a remote villager's life. And I've never seen that type of diffusion. To your point about the Industrial Revolution, Klaus, you know, I would say, you know, we're still waiting for the Industrial Revolution to reach some large parts of the world 250 years after. The internet maybe took 30 years. Uh, maybe the cloud and mobile took 15 years. And now I think we're talking months, which to me, I think is perhaps the benefit. Doesn't mean to your core question, we shouldn't take something like AI safety yeah. as a core consideration right you know, at the design time. And so therefore, even when we launch these APIs, which we did this week, uh, one of the key things is the APIs have safety built into it for harmful content or the context in which they're used. So a lot of work needs to go into it still, but we think of both the unintended consequences and the benefits both being something that we harness. So you feel that GPT and similar technology will become very fast, uh, 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 penetrating our lives, business lives, but also personal lives. Yeah, I, I, I think about, you know, we all remember in 2007, 2008, the birth, so that was the last time I would say we had major platforms being born, right? The mobile platform, uh, and the cloud platform. And, you know, in the last 15 years, they've gone mainstream. You know, we're still, I would say, you know, still in the throes of its penetration, but it's significantly understood that this technology is making a real difference. Uh, I think that the AI piece and this particular generation of AI uh, is showing that type of, I would say, platform shift. And just to kind of give you an intuition, Klaus, the, uh, as to what exactly happened. Like, why are we talking about AI in January of 23? After all, we were talking about it last year. But there seems to be even, I, I had not expected, if you had asked me last month coming to WEF, would I be talking about uh, AI this much? But it turns out that, you know, even the chat GPT moment has, I think, captured people's yeah. imagination. But we started the work with OpenAI, I would say, three and a half years ago, uh, when we started building the AI supercomputer in Azure to train these large models. So in fact, the, the, the workload of this particular form of AI requires a complete rethink even in the system architecture of the uh, computing infrastructure. And we did that hard work and trained these models. And when you look at GPT-3 to 3.5 to what's coming, these are non-linear developments. So they're showing emergent capability. And I'm not saying this is the last model architecture innovation. There'll be more to come. But the fact is that these things by themselves are becoming platforms that I think truly can make a difference. Let's see. Uh, we see we see audience. I, I raise a question. Who of you has um, made already his own personal experience with GPT? Yeah, it's an <laughs> That's, uh, it shows <laughs> the sophistication uh, of, of uh, the audience. 
Now, there's another technology which uh, we demonstrate here, and we actually do it in uh, uh, cooperation, in partnership with Microsoft and with Accenture. Uh, but we have uh, 70, 80 companies uh, in a consortium behind it, uh, behind us. It's uh, the Global Collaboration Village, which is the first, uh, probably the first metaverse application for public good. Uh, what are your thoughts about it, uh, Satya? First of all, I think the vision you've had, Klaus, around uh, you know using this new technology of uh, metaverse and these immersive experiences to bring the world together to both have that sense of community presence uh, and collaboration, I think it's just absolutely needed, right? I mean, if I think about what is special about Davos, it's about the ability for multiple stakeholders to come convene, yeah. learn, debate, come out of it with energy on what they can do to change the world. Um, and so to some degree, to say that if there's some new technology that can, for example, really bring this global collaboration village to life, where not only can people collaborate when they're here, uh, but it can be an ongoing thing. I think it's fantastic. So I think if those, I would encourage everyone to go see the exhibits uh, because I feel the thing that is most, for me, uh, uh, game changing about this particular technology is that sense of presence one has, right? Which is uh, when you're even virtually interacting. I think during the pandemic, all of us obviously did a lot of video meetings. Uh, and I think it, it has definitely got us through the pandemic, and I think they're going to be very much part of our lives. And I think of this as a very natural extension of it, because beyond video meetings, if you can have more immersive experiences where that presence, the co-presence can be felt, you can understand the impact uh, of any of these hard topics that we're talking about, I think that can be pretty game changing. So I think it's a brilliant idea. I'm glad to be partnered with you on it. And I would really Sorry. encourage everyone to participate. Let me, let me just see who has participated uh, at the demonstration. So, so haven't, I think, have still an opportunity yes. uh, to do so. But um, let me come back, uh, Satya, to an issue which we discussed also last time. It's uh, cybersecurity. We discuss it uh, every year, and, uh, and uh, it seems that it gets every year worse. And um, it's undermining, actually, the trust into the uh, digital system. Um, so what can we... Uh, do we have any chance to enhance um, trust into our digital infrastructure? Yeah, it's a, uh, I think you said it well, because in some sense, as digital technology uh, gets um, much more you know, pervasive in our sort of economy and in our life, uh, the unfortunate consequence of it is also uh, cyber crime and, uh, and cyber security issues are on the rise. In fact, I think there was a great panel uh, today, from what I understand, on some critical infrastructure. Uh, and in fact, if you look at what Microsoft had, has done in the case of Ukraine or Albania, these are all well recorded. Uh, at this point in terms of the work we had to do to protect essentially critical infrastructure and even nation states that are under threat. But to your point, interesting enough, you phrased it right, which is in order for us to have trust and security, you have to have an approach which is zero trust, uh, which is kind of the paradox. In fact, the, the way uh, the, the security community talks about the best way for you to have security is to assume breach and then think about your defense, uh, if you will. And so therefore, we have at Microsoft developed an end-to-end -end infrastructure, whether it's from identity to the endpoint security to application security to uh, the uh, infrastructure security with the zero trust architecture. But not only that, we, are, you know, we see trillions of signals, right? Because it's, at the end of the day, it's an intelligence game. Mm -hmm. And so we are taking the intelligence slash signals we have and using it actively, right? The only reason why we were able to intervene in the Ukrainian situation was because we saw the signals long before even the attacks, and therefore we were able to then help evacuate essentially the Ukrainian government into the cloud. And so those are the kinds of proactive action that we have to take, uh, I think, in order to protect. So the operational security posture of every organization, every nation, every public you know, critical infrastructure institution is going to be very, very important.
But how do you explain that most of the companies are not yet on the level they should be and what can be done in order so, to increase, to make it, let's say, a general rule like everybody uh, today probably closes uh, so the door in, uh, in, in the evening. What can we do? Yeah, I mean, wh one of the things um, in which we always advise is, you know, you use the cloud. So, for example, the place, one of the ways to be secure is not to be fighting this alone. Uh, because at some level, you want to be able to get leverage. If, if you go back to what I said, it, this is a signals game, you want to have the signal strength on your side versus being isolated. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why I think it's going to be very important for us, especially around local government, public infrastructure, to be able to modernize the infrastructure and have it uh, run in what is environments that are really well suited to fight uh, the cyber criminal activity. I might change uh, to a certain extent the nature of our discussion, come back to an issue which of course is very much uh, uh, in our minds this week here in, in Davos. It's the energy um, sustainability and energy transformation. And you are one of the pioneering companies because you want to be by 2030 not only carbon neutral, but carbon negative. By 2050. Which means to, yeah. Yeah, which means, uh, to to uh, take up the sins in the past right. and to correct them. Now, um, what what would be your advice to other companies? And what can Microsoft? What can what can the technology like your technology do in order to help other companies to achieve uh, to go faster in energy trans uh, in energy security and energy? Yeah. Uh, so I mean, first I, I would say. We, you know, we're doing a lot first to make sure our house in order because um, uh, given the commitments we have made uh, each year, we audit them and we're making sure that we are making progress on it. And quite frankly, uh, uh, in the last year, for example, I think on scope one and scope two, we did a good job, reduced our emissions by 17%, whereas scope three increased because of the increased usage of the cloud and our gaming consoles and a lot of those, uh, they increased by close to 20%. So we have our work cut out. In fact, I was very, very pleased even this year uh, early on to see the work that we put into Xbox in order to reduce its energy footprint uh, when at rest. So therefore, I think there's a lot of work we're doing ourselves, quite frankly. Uh, like, uh, after all, you know, all those AI supercomputers consume a lot of energy. And so one of the key things is that everything from the data center design to the power draw uh, of the chassis in which these GPUs are racked, uh, I think uh, the cooling systems, this is sort of innovation agenda that's front and center for us. Um, the second thing, though, to your point, Klaus, which is one of the places where I think we can make a real difference and we're working hard and we have you know, launched something called uh, uh, the Cloud for Sustainability uh, is around carbon accounting, right? So one of the, it's, as somebody described it to me, it's like we are trying to deploy an ERP system at the same time as the gap rules are being created. And so you need an approach even. Uh, to how one does carbon accounting uh, that is more flexible and keeps up with all the data that's coming in. And so we, we, are, we, we have a software system with many partners. Uh, we now want every small business, for example, I, I'm here, like in Europe, I think every bank now is going to look at even sure. the carbon footprint of companies before giving credit. Uh, and so in order to enable that and enable the fluency of that, I think we want, I can do a lot of work. And one other thing, I'd also mention going back to some of the AI pieces and even sort of you mentioned quantum. I think the core, at least my layman's understanding of even the energy transition challenge is we want to take 250 years of chemistry and compress it into 25 years. And if that is going to be possible, or one of the ways that is going to be possible is with computing power and especially computational chemistry. And so we're doing a lot of work in uh, whether it's AI techniques or even quantum inspired algorithms, even being run on classical uh, to help with, I would say, computational chemistry and the discovery of new molecules that can perhaps accelerate uh, this energy transition. I want to take you up on the word quantum, uh, come back to the uh, force it as revolution. For some people, quantum is still something in the future. For some, it's already reality. Where do you stand in terms of? I, 
you know, we, we had a research program in quantum. In fact, in the last year, there have been some real breakthroughs because we've had a, an approach to quantum where we are trying to not just achieve quantum supremacy, but, you know, to be able to build a general purpose quantum computer, you need to have sufficient number of stable qubits. And so the approach we have taken is that approach where can we build a general purpose quantum computer? And, uh, you know, we have sort of published results on some of the breakthroughs in the last year. So I do think it's still, you know, a ways away. It's not here today. But I think the interesting thing is the software stack that needs to be built for quantum is getting built actively. In fact, if anything, the entire the fact that you can simulate uh, quantum algorithms on classical is one place where we can, in fact, already start benefiting. Uh, but let's face it. I mean, there's uh, you know lots of things uh, that are happening that are rapidly moving. Whether it's about uh, on the encryption side or how do you in the post quantum world protect yourself? Mm -hmm. um, and so these are all fields that are actively both being researched as well as being deployed. If we look at economic growth in the last uh, ten years or so. It has been very much driven by uh, companies like yours, and uh, there was a kind of tech boom. And now, uh, lately, we have seen the news about layoffs. And um, does it mean that the existing business model on which the tech industry was based is coming to an end and has to be replaced by a new model? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say there are two things, right? One is. I look at it in two ways. One is the overall economic growth in the world. Um, because at the end of the day, all of us are governed by what is happening in the world, inflation adjusted in terms of economic growth. So because no one can sort of defy gravity. Uh, and the gravity here is inflation adjusted economic growth. And I would say all up in the world, the inflation-adjusted economic growth has been pretty weak. Um, and one of the things that I'm optimistic is digital technology can help boost it. Things like artificial intelligence can help boost it. That said, in the tech industry, we grow multiple times GDP. Uh, and so the question is, during the pandemic, there was rapid acceleration. I think we are going to go through a phase today where there is going to be some amount of normalization of that demand. Uh, quite frankly, we in the tech industry will also have to get efficient, right? It's not about everyone else doing more with less. We will have to do more with less. So we will have to show our own productivity gains with our own yeah. sort of technology. And then coming out of this cycle, though, Klaus, I do believe that as a percentage of GDP, tech spend, by definition, will increase. And not because it should just increase. It will increase by, because of its contribution to the all-up GDP growth. So that's sort of how I view, I think, what's happening in our industry, our business model challenges, but more importantly, what I think are the economic challenges in the world. But Satya, I, I would go maybe even one step further and would say the next phase must comprise much more the application of uh, those technologies in areas where it is not yet applied. And I'm not thinking only of uh, developing countries, I'm thinking of uh, education, I'm thinking of agriculture. If you look uh, just uh, at those two areas, they are very old fashioned. So there's so a large, uh, let's say, uh, opportunity for those technologies to penetrate much better it's a, the overall economy. Would you agree? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's a very important observation because in some sense, what you're pointing out is also economic growth is not just economic growth. It's got to be equitable economic growth yeah. that is spread by geography, by sector, yeah. uh, by segment. It's not about just large businesses, uh, but it's about large and small businesses. It's about public sector institutions. And that, I think, is the crux of it, right? I think in this next phase of globalization, even, uh, I think when we talk about economic growth, we'll have to think about it at the core. Like, what's the equity of that economic growth, and how is it being spread? Just to, to go even one step further, if you, if you go into this direction, I mean, uh, the talent question becomes key. Now, you have attracted uh, the talents, the best talents in Silicon Valley, uh, in, in Seattle. Um, isn't there a, a lack of talents? But let's take uh, agriculture to translate the potential into reality. It's a, you know, so, first of all, let's face it, I mean, 
there is, there's a real issue around um, skills, reskilling, uh, and talent. I, I, I'm very hopeful that some of these new technologies are going to be helpful in that process. What I mean by that is, you know, we I, I gave you already that example of Andrich Karpathy and him using GitHub Copilot, and as an elite AI developer getting uh, assistance from a co-pilot. But the same thing is true for a first-line worker using, say, one of our tools like Power Platform to be able to use a natural language prompt to do some workflow automation. So think about this. This is someone who is in the front line who has domain expertise but doesn't have IT skills, is able to now do IT tasks. That's one way for us to, in some sense, bridge the talent gap. Yeah. So I think that you're pointing in fact, even the rebalancing of even software engineering talent. In fact, if you think about it, then it was actually two years ago that the number of software engineers that are being hired outside of what is considered the tech industry is higher than in the tech industry. So that means going forward, we will have more of the digital skills spread much more evenly across the economy. And that's a good thing, right? Because we need that. We need them in agriculture. We need them in banking. We need them in healthcare. We need them in education. We, we spoke about the Global Collaboration Village and um, uh, I, I mentioned we have uh, 80 companies behind and we have a permanent exchange of ideas. And one, one uh, let's say, uh, conviction came out that uh, the metaverse will uh, be a tremendous, uh, uh, will provide us with new capabilities, particularly in education. Would you agree? Uh, 100%, because in some sense, if you look at, there are two, in fact, if you sort of combine the two technologies that I think people are talking about, take metaverse and take uh, AI. Yeah. If you put these two things together, what does that mean? Like it means that you can now help people learn with other people together, collaborate across space and time, yeah. and most importantly, Something like a co-pilot being there to help even diagnose the conceptual mistakes a student is making right when they make it, uh, and then help them yeah. uh, overcome that. I think so. I think I think this notion of collaboration and learning together is where I think we can make a real leap forward. I, I think uh, one of the reasons why, uh, let's say, this annual meeting is a success. Uh, it's not only working together, but it's the serendipity effect. But if you do it in the virtual world, in, in uh, let's say again in the global collaboration building, you can build in the serendipity with artificial intelligence into the system. So you know exactly who is the best in order to help you to solve your own problem. That's right, that's right. In fact, one of the my favorite features even in uh, one of the, in the products we've recently built is whenever you want a, to research a topic, yeah. it doesn't just tell you the answer to the topic, but it tells you the people that you should connect with. And exactly. that ability to know whom to talk to to learn more as something that is, I think, is as important as learning more. And you can build it in. That's right. Now, I, we are running out of time, but uh, I would like to come back to one question which we also touched upon last time. It is uh, the future of work. And uh, so there's a lot of discussion about remote work, and I think uh, you and your company has been very, let's say, engaged into discussions about this issue. What is your learning from those discussions and what are your recommendations? I, I think that the, the key observation I'd make is we're still learning because uh, uh, the, you know, th there's been real structural change. Uh, I don't think we can just say we'll go back to 2019, nor can we say we're going to live like is, as if it is 2020, uh, if you will. So therefore, there is real... Uh, new patterns of work emerging. There are three trends that we are observing, Klaus, which I think are, in, you know, to me at least, are guiding even our own set of decisions. So the first is, there is what I'll characterize as this productivity paranoia, right? Which is every leader thinks that somehow they're not being productive, but there is everybody who's working in the organization feels burnt out. So there is that debate. Uh, as to who is true and uh, what is the truth. And so therefore, I would say less, more data, less dogma will be a good way to sort of uh, end that debate. And in other words, 
at the end of the day, organizations have to be productive. There's no question. The outcomes matter. And the question is, instead of being dogmatic about the way to achieve the outcome, we should sort of focus on the outcome and then rediscover perhaps new patterns of uh, successful work. So that's one. The second thing I'd say is we're also learning that people come for other people, not because somebody set policies. Uh, so people don't come for policy, but people will come for people. And if you buy that, then I think we all have to even learn many new soft skills, right? Convening, you know, calling a meeting versus convening an event. Two different things. Um, you know, because you set, like when you do convene an event, you set so much more context, you, you market it, you help people have a successful event. Uh, whereas meeting, sometimes you go in unprepared, you don't worry about what the consequences of that are and what have you. So I think we all have to learn, be much more deliberate, learn a lot of soft skills so that people-to-people -people connections are really forming. Because that's, I think, very important for social capital. The last thing I'd even say is, it will be very important for us not to take for granted that the people who work in our organization uh, are all connected to the company's mission or the organization's mission. And so re-recruiting, training, in fact, one data point we observed is unless and until people feel fulfilled in their jobs in terms of new skills that they're ac acquired, they're not going to have loyalty to the organization. So us really investing in their progress inside of the job and the sense of accomplishment, I think, are going to be important. So tools and technologies are there, but I would say new management practice and sensibility is perhaps what we will all have to develop. In this context, you just used the word loyalty. How would you describe loyalty of an employee towards Microsoft? <laughs> no, look, I think at the end of the day, I always say, the most important thing is for people to sort of think of who are working at Microsoft is the one is they should think of Microsoft as a platform to be able to connect with our mission to achieve what's core to them. Uh, I think that's the social equation. Uh, I think the loyalties only exist if Microsoft as a platform is helping them achieve what they want to achieve. Uh, it's not a, it, it's, it's, it's sort of not a, uh, something that we take for granted. It's something that we have to earn as an organization by giving people a platform. So you have to build an attractor. Absolutely. And also give them a reason why yeah, they yeah, think of Microsoft. The reason, yeah. it's the purpose. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I may, I may uh, uh, just um, uh, close. I think we are already over time. But one short um, question. Uh, I, I have met so many leaders, and you may have seen in the agenda, um, I wrote a small article about how I define leadership, and I said leadership is a combination of um, uh, soul, brain, heart, muscles, and nerves. Uh, so soul standing for purpose, uh, so brain standing for professionalism, uh, so heart standing for passion, and uh, the muscles for implementation capability, and good nerves you need today. And I think we just have seen a leader who combines all those five dimensions. So thank you very thank much. You so much.